Hi, I'm Jeff, and welcome back to my Jeff. About a year and a half ago, I built this power draw bar for my milling machine. It's based around a 4-inch air cylinder I found on eBay. Truthfully, it's worked ever since. However, if you've seen my recent video, I put a new motor on the mill, and there's just not enough room for this giant power draw bar cylinder anymore. So I guess I'll just make a different one. To get the force I need in a slimmer footprint, I'll stack multiple cylinders together in the same assembly. This is sometimes called a three-stage cylinder, so, well, that's what I'll call it. Each stage will be machined from solid and nest between the ones above and below it. And I can actually do this with some aluminum square stock. And just for funsies, what if we did it on the lathe? After the stock comes off of the saw, I'm using the four-jaw chuck in the lathe to true up the cut faces. I'm not very worried about making the workpiece centered at this time. This operation is just to square up the two sides to proper thickness before layout. Anymore, I've really enjoyed using properly sharpened high-speed steel tools for turning aluminum. I tend to prefer carbide otherwise, but I can get the HSS blank to be quite sharp and perform nicely. Measuring all four corners of the workpiece tells me how parallel I've got my two cut faces. So it's not really best practices to use the unmachined edge of the material as my datum for marking these holes, but they are just clearance holes, not critical. I'm just going to drill them on the drill press anyway. I also found and marked the center of the material on the other side of it, which will be what I use as my center reference for cutting the cylinder body. This little trick is a favorite of mine. It's a floating dead center to get zero on just a point. I learned it from an A-bomb video years and years ago, and I've seen other videos on it since. With the boring bar, I have an indicator on the bed of the lathe measuring my depth. Since it's moving pretty fast, I call out the rotations on the indicator verbally. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. When the hole is large enough, I don't really need the indicator anymore. I can just stop the cut visually. Once I've finished the bore, I can finish the floor. After the cylinder bore is cut to size, I bore the hole out where the rod will pass. There are a number of ways to seal this hole around the rod, and I chose the simpler method of having two O-ring grooves, which I don't think I got on camera.
High-speed steel tooling is also ideal for making this interrupted cut on the outside of the cylinder. This cut seems like just aesthetic, but not only will it reduce unnecessary weight of the finished product, it'll also be crucial for lining up other operations further down the line. The last cut on this setup is the face groove for the o-ring seal. I use a trepanning tool I ground out of high speed steel and I've shown it in other videos. Now thanks to the outside of the cylinder being machined in line with the bore for the rod, flipping the part around and getting it accurately dialed in with the four jaw chuck is actually a much easier task. On this side of the part, I cut a short locating boss for the other cylinders to align with. As you can see, I did this three times. Here's a detail shot of what those o-ring grooves for the piston rod look like. I just cut them pretty simply with a shop made boring bar and a shop ground high speed steel tool. The plumbing for air inside the cylinder looks way more complicated than it really is. In practice I was able to lay it all out by hand and then I just drilled it all on the drill press. I even used the classic redneck depth stop aka a piece of tape or a sharpie mark on my drill bit. Now it's worth noting that while I was building these parts, uh, this is the short period of time I did not have a motor on the mill, hence all the lathe and drill press work. This top cap piece is a little simpler than the cylinders, but it was also a little bit more interesting to try to hold on to in the lathe. I cut this locating boss into the part, and then drilled it for air ports on the drill press just like I did with the other pieces. The pistons themselves are just aluminum discs with an o-ring groove. The rods are pieces of drill rod with a threaded end, and they're just going to screw into that disc. I was able to make them all in the same setup on the lathe out of a piece of round bar. After getting the center hole drilled and tapped, I hate that tap handle by the way, I threw it away after this project, I then started to work with my parting tool, making the o-ring grooves and also pre-staging my parting cuts. This was kind of a mental check for measuring and chamfering the pieces. It's a simple part, but those tend to be the easiest to screw up. Speaking of simple parts, the rod will need a very short thread cut on it, which is always fun to do on the lathe with single point threading. It really hasn't turned out to be a problem, but in the future, if I was to do this again, I think I could go with a smaller thread diameter, just to ensure that there's a larger shoulder for the piston to tighten onto.
Okay, now all I gotta do is make a couple more of these, but first, I think the robot's alive again. In the timeline of events in my workshop, this last piece, the lifter plate for the drawbar, was the last thing to get made out of this assembly, and it was the first part I made on the CNC mill after mounting the new servo motor to the spindle. As I've done many times before, I drilled all of my through holes first so I could use them to bolt the part to a sacrificial plate, and that allows me access around all sides. I hope you're like me and immediately concerned with this stuttering motion the machine is making. I couldn't figure out what it was until I noticed that in Mach 3 there's a setting for constant velocity mode. And this was turned off somehow, so I restarted everything and it was smooth sailing from there. If you haven't seen my other power drawbar video, this plate's purpose is to lift up on the spindle body while the cylinder pushes down on the drawbar, and this keeps all forces off of the spindle bearings themselves. I decided the best way to locate this assembly on the mill head was by hand, measuring and checking that it lined up perfectly with the spindle, then marking and mounting the holes and drilling and tapping them. Everything's finally ready for assembly because I totally haven't test fit and function checked all these parts dozens of times before shooting this footage. All the parts will be held together with these B7 grade threaded rods. I cut them to length off of a larger piece. The top plate is actually threaded uh, for this specific rod and the other plates just have clearance holes to slide over them for guidance. The pistons are a tight enough fit into the cylinders that it's easiest to very gently press them in with the help of my bench vise, uh, the one with the soft aluminum jaws. All the air fittings are pushed to connect because those make life easy. I'm prepping them with the yellow Teflon tape that's actually made for gas.
I do wish I had countersunk an area for these nuts. Letting them sit below the lifter plate like this is cheese grade, and they're closer to the spindle belt than I'd like. The air coming in to push the cylinder down is shared amongst the three cylinders, whereas the air coming in to push a cylinder back up only goes to the bottom piston. The holes on the other side of the cylinders are exhaust for the middle two pistons. The top and bottom ones are vestigial. They're part of an older design idea, and I just left them in. This is a very funny size comparison between the old setup and the new. This entire assembly weighs less than half of what the old cylinder weighed by itself. Hey, it works. Hey, let's see that one more time. Okay, just one more time. Last time, I promise. The cylinder functions wonderfully. I can adjust the drawbar here just to make sure that it's properly tight and to get it as close to the piston as possible. Even though this is a much smaller setup, it actually gets me about 17% more power overall, which is a huge upgrade from the old giant single-stage cylinder. I never had a problem with that one either, using any of the tools I have, so we'll see how hard I can push this with the new spindle motor. This was a fun project, and I'm pretty proud of it. I was excited to share it with everyone here. Uh, for a number of reasons, though, no, I'm not uh, distributing plans for this. I was hoping that this video would be explanatory enough that if you wanted to do this project, you could design it yourself. In fact, if you have any ideas for this, you could throw those down in the comments section for the next guy building it. I want to give a big thanks to all my patrons on Patreon. They got to see this video before the rest of you all did, and they did so proudly displaying one of my stickers. I, I assume. Anyway, you know all the other YouTube things to do, so thank you for watching.